there are certain politicians belonging to the Sinhala community who have jumped left, right and centre. But that we call as a political acumen. But when a politician of the you know, upcountry community does it, we call that jumping. So if he invites you, uh, let's say tomorrow, to be part of the cabinet, would you accept? It depends on the portfolio. Okay. Because it has to be something that we should be able to work with. But then while India needs to be taking responsibility, shouldn't the Sri Lankan government be doing much more than uh, a, a foreign country? No, of course. But aren't these RPCs uh, having too much of a monopoly here, uh, which is resulting in them, you know, being able to place a lot of demands and True. get who things away? True, who gave them the monopoly? The unions didn't give them the monopoly. The unions were, you know, we were very happy with how the estates were being run earlier. Mm -hmm. Because when they were private entities, they actually looked after the workers. Hello and welcome to another episode of On Fire here on Daily Mirror. I'm Isvaran Ratnam. The uh, issues faced by uh, the estate community uh, continues to uh, grab the spotlight uh, in the media. Uh, successive governments have made uh, so many promises, but very little seems to have been done. To discuss uh, the issues faced by the estate community and other matters, joining me on the program today is the Secretary General of the Ceylon Workers' Congress, Mr. Jeevan Thondaman. Welcome to the program. Hello. So, Mr. Anuman, what is the situation as far as the estate community is concerned? Well, I personally feel I need to correct you on that introduction which you yes. made. You know, when uh, you say a lit very little has been done for the estate community, I think uh, more than what has been done for the estate community, I feel people in general lack awareness on what has actually been done for the upcountry community. For example, I think uh, the numbers should speak for themselves. Initially, when the plantation workers came in, which was uh, 1823, mm -hmm. you know, the next year is the 200th year of the uh, arrival. So initially when they came in, you know, there was a large number, there was close to more than a million. But, um, you know, gradually, if you look at modern history around the 70s to 80s, there was about 500,000 workers. This is after the repatriation. So you are looking at 500,000 workers belonging to this community. And uh, as time went on, if you had noticed, we had bought in the Sripada College of Education, which created teachers from our very own community. And likewise, we had expanded inf into the informal sector. I agree that there's still a long way to go, but uh, looking at the way forward, I'm not willing to negate whatever we've done till now. Mm -hmm. So right so now- But when you say we, you're talking about the CWC no, or when I say When I say we, I'm not talking about the governments, nor am I talking about the Ceylon Workers' Congress. When I say we, I mean each and every representative of the upcountry community. Mm -hmm. That can involve my rival parties or it can involve any party for that matter. Whoever's looking after the interests of the upcountry, I'm speaking on behalf of them here. Mm -hmm. But then, do you think that successive governments have also addressed uh, these issues more? No, I, I feel personally successive governments, and I mentioned this in Parliament as well, I personally feel that for 30 years, this that 30 year period was, I would believe, the dark ages for the upcountry community. And that 30 year period is between 1948 to 1977. It's because, uh, you know, we were rendered stateless, mm -hmm. as you're well aware, our civic rights were removed. And, uh, you know, we were not Sri Lankans, but we were living in Sri Lanka. Even today, many people refuse to accept us as Sri Lankan. And, you know, they still think we're Indian and Indian whatnot. Indian origin. And I mean, uh, see, uh, there are people who trace the origins back to India. In Malaysia, for example, there's a Malaysian Indian Congress. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me the representatives of Malaysian Indian Congress are Indian? You can go tell them that they'll kick yeah. you out of Malaysia. So, <laughs> it's, it's not about that, you know. I think people need to understand what our history is. And when one community was asking for a separate state, we were asking for a separate identity. Mm -hmm. And you know, that is the thin line that needs to be seen. So long story short, uh, we are Sri Lankan first and foremost, and we are Indian origin. But however, now the trend is changing. And wherever we go, we are trying to say that we are hill country origin. So what is the separate identity that you were looking for? Because like I told you, we were rendered stateless. Yeah. And uh, you know, um, we were just allocated this place. Wherever there were tea bushes, our people would be there. Okay. That was the mentality that was there. And uh, for them to branch out into something else, into the informal sector, 
It was very difficult. It was a struggle. So for that 30 years, including the late leader, Honorable Swami Murthy Tondaman, with, along with many other leaders, it was not just him, along with many other leaders had fought and struggled and got our uh, rights uh, under the reign of, uh, first it was J.R. Jawadana and mm -hmm. then uh, Honorable Rana Singh Prima Dasa. And more recently in 2003, I believe the late Armugam Tondaman had uh, acquired citizenship for 300,000 people So um, under the patronage of, uh, sorry, uh, current President Ranul Vikramasinghe. Ranul Vikramasinghe. So, isn't India's uh, uh, involvement with the plantation community uh, sort of giving this impression that, you know, they are, you know, more or less, uh, quote unquote, outsiders because India seems to be doing a lot for uh, the estate community as Correct. opposed to maybe other because areas? Because I personally feel India and Sri Lanka should take responsibility for the plight of the plantation workers simply because of the fact that when the Srima Sastri Pact came about, that was a very inhumane uh, mm. arrangement in my opinion because I mean uh, many people are still uh, you know they're not they're not aware of things like this as I said awareness is the issue with Sri Lanka yeah. so you know when the Srima Shastri pact came about in the 60s what has happened was out of a community out of this particular IOT community that was living here second generation third generation calling Sri Lanka their home the Sri Lankan government and the Indian government then had made a arrangement whereby they repatriated close to 40 percent of the community back to India and they've kept them in places in India. Mm -hmm. And these are people who have gone, who have been repatriated back to India, gone back to India without knowing what India was or where they belong. Because, you know, they were born in Sri Lanka, they were born in the estates and they were forcibly repatriated. So this was very inhumane. I mean, in a family of five, you know, you'll see uh, two brothers staying here and two sisters going back to India. Mm -hmm. So what kind of uh, cruel arrangement was that? So I definitely feel India and Sri Lanka do have a, you know, responsibility towards that. And in that sense, I mean, I must uh, appreciate Prime Minister Modi's efforts in this because, see, India's connection with the uh, Tamils of upcountry, it's, it's very clear. It's purely development. Because now through India, we are receiving 10,000 houses. We've already received 4,000. And uh, we've always maintained a close relationship with them. And with the Sri Lankan government, you know, uh, that 30-year period when, while, you know, other people, while other communities and their forefathers were entitled to benefits and health care and education and what not. For 30 years, an entire section of the population was neglected. Mm -hmm. So following 30 years, we started our program. You know, that's when we started developing. So we started the race late, but that doesn't mean we're not equal. But then while India needs to be taking responsibility, shouldn't the Sri Lankan government be doing much more than uh, a, a foreign country? No, of course. But the reality of the matter is, the Sri Lankan government, at the end of the day, you know, whichever government that comes, and I'm not just saying, uh, you know, with any particular government in right. mind, I, I believe post the war, you know, post the war, after 2009, the upcountry Tamils in the North and East have the same issue, mm -hmm. you know, reconcil reconciliation. And, uh, you know, we need to have a government, a stable government, first of all, which will look at the interests of all communities, not just look at the interests of the politician representing that community, mm -hmm. if you understand what I mean. Yeah. So, you know, when you take into account the interests of the community, then we need to come up with permanent solutions rather than temporary peace means. And, uh, you know, just, we can't, we can't, you know, like, we have our development needs. For example, we don't have roads, we don't have clean drinking water, we don't have good hospitals. So those have to happen, you know, like how it works in the south, in the north, in the east. That is a program that needs to go on. But apart from that, we have certain policy-related matters that needs to be taken forward. For example, Many of the laws that govern the upcountry Tamils, they are still archaic, they're mm. draconian. For example, we have, uh, you know, the Indian Immigrant Labour Act, which refers to the upcountry Tamils as coolies. And recently, one of, uh, one of, the, one of the senior most judges from upcountry had been taken into the High Court. I don't think he's a coolie. Mm -hmm. So we have come way beyond that. Right now, there's only 135,000 people working in the tea estates. So that, where does that leave the remaining 1.4 million upcountry Tamils? All of them are not coolies, they're all in good positions. Some of them are in parliament, some of them have been former ministers. So all these needs to be changed because like I said, it goes back to that identity. It goes back to that question, who am I? If I don't know who I am, then I won't be able to address my needs, nor will you be able to address my needs. The CWC has often been seen uh, as, as a party that would align with uh, the government in power. Uh, this is the allegation, I, I use the word allegation because there have been criticism on uh, the CWC in the past aligning itself with, uh, you know, whoever comes into power as opposed to taking a position on policy. Uh, but now we, 
the CWC right now is not uh, uh, in government. Um, no, why I is mean, that? I, I need to uh, make a small correction there. Whether it was uh, any of the late leaders who had governed CWC, it's not that, you know, they, see, they feel this person has become the president, I need to go join them. Because one thing we have never done is we have never crossed over behind anyone's back. Mm -hmm. Even now, we had spoken, I had gone and conveyed my news to the SLPP and I told them I'm not happy with this and I'm withdrawing my support. Unlike certain other individuals, how, you know, they jump. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I'd just like to say one thing. It's, it's you know, I, I find it really interesting. There are certain politicians belonging to the Sinhala community who have jumped left, right and centre. But that we call as political acumen. But when a politician of the you know upcountry community does it we call that jumping mm -hmm. how is that fair why the double standards and likewise there's also one more aspect in this now you say we need policy you know we need to take a firm stand with policies all right let's take a look at the current parliamentary setup in every political structure in every country you have the liberals and the conservatives am i right yes correct now in sri lanka you would view the sjb as liberal you would view the slfp as conservative. Mm -hmm. Likewise, you'd view UNP as liberal. You'd view SLPP as conservative. Now, SLPP and UNP are on one side with the breakaways. SLFP and SJB are on one side with the uh, breakaways. Whose side do I take? Mm -hmm. Whose policy is correct? So, at the end of the day, policy decisions, that is something that should be left to us. When you are in the cabinet, you can bring about the policy decisions you want, regardless of who the president is. But at the same time, in that gap, we don't believe in what certain North and East politicians believe in where they say we want only policy-related decisions, so we're going to take a policy-related stand and oppose any government that comes. Because today, people in the North and East, they're suffering, aren't they? There are so many orphanages there. There are so many schools there without water, without toilets, without any of the facilities. So we can't do the same in our country because, like I said, we are 30 years behind. We need to cover up for those 30 years. So what I mean by saying we need to be with the ruling party is, even though we are with the ruling party, we will oppose the ruling party at times where we feel injustice is being done to the people. And, but at the same time, we need to be with the ruling party to ensure the development progress of the country. Mm -hmm. For example, I'd just like to cite two examples, actually. One example is recently what I had done. I was with the ruling party. I had opposed the government in the Islamic burial issue. I had opposed the government in the fertilizer ban. And I had also opposed the government in certain other policy-related matters. And finally, when uh, you know we realized that there is no moving forward from the chemical fertilizer ban, we resigned because it affected the upcountry directly. And likewise, uh, in 2007, I believe, Honorable, the late leader, Honorable Arugam Thundaman, he was a cabinet minister in uh, the former president, uh, Mahindra Rajapaksha's cabinet. Yeah. And he had filed a case against the former president, uh, Mahindra Rajapaksha, while he was a cabinet minister against illegal detention. Mm -hmm. So we, regardless of whether we, uh, you know, were being in the ruling party or the opposition, as long as our backbone is intact, we'll always make a decision by the people. But uh, why aren't you with the government right now? I mean, Ranil Vikram Singh, when he became prime minister, he had invited uh, a number of political parties to join in. Isn't there more that you can do if you are part No, but of the uh, we have given our consent to be part of the government. Ranil, Honorable uh, Ranil Vikram Singh had, in fact, contacted us the day he was sworn in. And he had told us we would like for you to join the government. Mm -hmm. And likewise, you know, we had also very clearly expressed that we have no qualms about other upcountry parties being in the government as well, mm -hmm. because, but they should all maintain their, you know, political affiliations. For example, now we are independent. Should we join the government? Yes, we will exercise our independence, because this is not about politics. And I believe that's what the president also wished, because it's about rebuilding the country, and the only way we can do that is with an unbiased type. So then you say that you have given your consent to of be in I the do. government. No, we have already spoken to Honorable President and okay. we had met him and we had given it in writing as well that we'll be, uh, yeah, we'll be supporting to. the government provided reforms are going to take place and there's a deadline as to which uh, you know progress is to be so made. So if he invites you, uh, let's say, tomorrow to be part of the cabinet, would you accept? It depends on the portfolio. Okay. Because it has to be something that we should be able to work with. You know, there is no point in me taking a portfolio for namesake just to have that prestige as Sri Lanka's youngest ever cabinet minister. It's yeah. not a, it's not a, it's not a show. No? But you are willing to be in the cabinet and of work course. with him to address the issues of, of course. The I mean, either me or any other political party who wants to come on board, we'd be more than happy to entertain. Now, this this issue with uh, uh, the uh, the uh, regional plantation companies is something that is continuing, and it doesn't seem uh, like there's going to be some compromise anywhere. Uh, do you think that the RPCs are holding uh, the plantation workers hostage? Of course I do. I mean, I see holding someone hostage, at, you know, I, it, I would say it's far worse than that because the level of exploitation that is taking place in uh, the tea estates, 
it's unreal and unions are being demonized again because people don't know you know people don't know the level of exploitation that takes place and also you know colombo is a very small place and when colombo is a very small place the rpc ceos all of them move along with pretty much everyone unlike the unions mm -hmm. so you know you can never demonize them but the reality of the matter is the situation is far worse you know i mean the recently the un rapporteur he had come down to sri lanka yeah. and in his report he has very clearly mentioned sri lanka is exhibiting modern uh, forms of slavery so why would he do that am i the one enslaving the people i don't have control over them i'm just running the union i can merely stand up for them mm -hmm. and that's what we've been doing recently in muskelia plantation we called a strike because the way they were treating the people was not right there have been instances i'm very sorry to say this there have been instances women have been sexually assaulted or raped in the estates by certain you know uh, people belonging to the management i don't wish to say which companies and the managers have gotten away scot free sexual harassment is a very real thing in the up country and um, what pains me is that people are not able to open their eyes and see it because with the rpcs recently in muskelia plantation in agrapatra plantation both the plantations in one week two people have been electrocuted mm -hmm. now in muskelia plantation for example one person was electrocuted now the, the people in up country they are unskilled workers you know plucking tea and working in the fields you ask an unskilled worker to go fix an electrical problem how will he do that he didn't have the safety gear he didn't have any of that and he had gone and uh, you know tried to fix this electrical uh, issue and he got electrocuted and he died so he's been told to fix it by uh, the rpc by, by, by the, the rpc company and he had died and he was 25 he was engaged his name is ganesh murthy mm -hmm. and that is a very bad uh, you know way to run the estate apart from that now recently in agrapatna plantation farmers the person who had died mr ramakrishnan he was 48 years old he is the father of three children he had gone and he had been electrocuted by an illegal fence in the estate now when we speak to the rpc they say no that fence was not put up by us it was illegally put up but by who ex that's the question now if it was illegally put up you have to be accountable to it it's your estate jdb has given it on lease to you mm -hmm. it didn't give it on lease to the encroacher and uh, what's worse is when that person had died they had tried to cover it up and say he had a heart attack now if we didn't step in and ask for a post mortem report we wouldn't have known now in both cases now in the muskelia plantation case we had fought and we had received the highest level uh, uh, of compensation for that worker they were agreeing to pay 15000 rupees for the per, for a 25 year old who died and we made them pay 4 million and likewise for agrapatna plantation we've kept our demands and we are looking at close to 5 million plus the education costs of the children to be covered and a self employment module for the wife of the deceased but you know this does not this is not going to bring the person back yeah but are these rpcs uh, having too much of a monopoly here uh, which is resulting in them you know being able to place a lot of demands and True. get who things away who gave them the monopoly the unions didn't give them the monopoly the unions were you know that we were very happy with how the estates were being run earlier mm -hmm. because when they were private entities they actually looked after the workers now with the rpcs it's all dollars and cents you know in parliament i've mentioned there's a saying you know when there were planters the estates were doing very well now there are no more planters it's all chartered accountants mm -hmm. they know how to balance the books they don't know how to balance the people and because of that people are suffering that's the reality of the matter you know when we go for a wage increment people yes. criticize us for the wages the plantation workers are receiving plantation workers in sri lanka one of the highest paid wage earners in the world people should know that last time when the late lead r gum tundaman was there we had received a 200% increase which has never before been done now even though we had done that after the wages board we received the 1000 rupees the much question yes. 1000 we had received a gazette notification through the wages board we had passed 1000 rupees but that is also still not coming into the no, hands but, of the workers no but what should the companies have done they should have said okay we honor the gazette and we will pay yeah. but they did not do that they went for an interim in injunction but the court quashed that they said no you have to pay 1000 but following that also they had you know not uh, paid the workers and they exploited them and today when the cost of living is well beyond just 1000 rupees a day the companies are saying we are willing to pay 1000 so what should i do mm -hmm. my move next to be is to increase it to 2000 that would be my agenda but then again exploitation you can't measure it for example they will say our cost of production is up as i've said chartered accountants mm -hmm. they know how to balance the books so when they say cost of production i know for a fact one of the ceos of a very famous company in sri lanka who is running the estate his salary is 3.2 million a month and you go to an estate the worker salary will barely touch 10000 i'm sure he can take a wage cut and give it to the worker what about issues like that 
So you mask all that in your cost of production. You mask the CEO, the manager, all their fuel consumption in the cost of production. You mask the, what do you call it, most of the bungalows, just so you know, most yeah. of the bungalows in the estates have been converted to tourism bungalows. Where's the accountability for that? In every estate, they cut two kilos, three kilos per way because they say moisture content, factory shortage. Where are those two, three kilos going? That's unaccounted tea. So these questions are never asked. Immediately, what have the Tundamans done for 82 years? We have done our best. But then can't, can't like uh, trade unions and political parties like the CWC and others, you know, push for changes which would ensure that, you know, RPCs uh, uh, have less monopoly and are held more accountable? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, look, Mr. Ishan, I mean, I have to be quite frank with you. And this is something I would say it openly. It, the free education system in this country was built on the shoulders of the upcountry workers. That has to be remembered. And uh, it is terrible that they don't get the respect they deserve right now. But at the same time, what you just mentioned, we have tried all that. Mm -hmm. We've tried to talk to the companies, we've had a dialogue, we've had a very uh, cordial relationship with them at one point of time. But we've realized, you know, talking is not getting us anywhere. So I had to resort to extreme measures as the General Secretary of CWC. And uh, in my opinion, I said, even if it stops the dollars coming into this country through tea, I will do it. You don't need the blood and sweat and tears of the upcountry workers to run the country. If you need the money from them, then you have to give them the respect that's received. When COVID came in, the managers were vaccinated, but the workers weren't. Mm -hmm. How is that fair? Just because, you know, they are from, you know, a economically poor background, that doesn't mean they get to be treated in a bad manner. That is terrible. And likewise, you also have to keep in mind that whatever said and done, whatever said and done, all the people, you know, all the, all the people uh, living in the urban sector criticizing the unions, they have to keep two things in mind. One is, we are not the same as unions in other fields. So your hatred towards that union or those unions mm -hmm. should not be uh, portrayed on us. And likewise, secondly, there's also one more factor. I noticed recently people said, oh, look, people from up country are going to, you know, going as domestic help, they're suffering. My question to people is then why are you hiring them? Demand equals supply. If you don't demand for upcountry help, then they are not going to come. They'll go for some other work. So, you know, please, uh, let's not be hypocritical is what I'm trying to say. I'm not going to shy away from criticisms, but something so toxic where people are not able to accept reality and see how to come to a solution, then there's not much we can do. What uh, What's the future of the CWC as a political party? Uh, I noticed recently at the elections, you all started going beyond, uh, uh, you know, Novarelia and Hatton and started campaigning in other areas as well. Are you looking at expanding uh, uh, as a political party? Uh, the CWC is one of the oldest political parties in the country, about 82 years, and this will be our 83rd year next. And uh, being that, I'd like to remind everyone that the CWC at one point of time decided the government of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. You know, we had 12 MPs, but due to divisive politics and uh, various other reasons, that had unfortunately broken down. But that did not shatter our strength as we retained our membership even till now. So it's not about expanding. If we look at an area and we feel our style of politics, our style of working, where a political solution and a development solution is parallelly needed, then we will definitely expand. There's no doubt about that. So that's... that's do, you, do you see, uh, I ask this because this is being discussed these days as well, is do you see the CWC aligning itself once again with uh, the Rajapaksha administration? It's not about CWC aligning itself with anyone anymore. It's about whoever the person being. They have to align themselves with our mentality because we are speaking for the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though we are two MPs now, I feel we've made, we made a, a loud, loud enough noise to grab the attention of certain other people. And I'd like, I'd like to clarify something. Now, with the Rajapakshas, see, I have no personal vendetta against them. In fact, it was the Honorable Mahindra Rajapaksha who got me into politics and I'll be grateful for that. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about that because he stood by me at a time when no one was. But at the same time, where I had clearly mentioned that our political relationship is over. Because our it's over. Yeah, because at that point of time, because right. our ideologies don't match. And when your ideologies don't match, it's difficult to sit in the same room again. So, um, you know, even though that relationship will be there, politically, I I find it highly doubtful, for the time being at least, unless there's a drastic change in the mindset of SLPP. Okay. There's a policy shift. So like, come an election, I mean, I mean, no, it's too early, but come an election, I mean, would you all be uh, looking at uh, supporting an opposition candidate or would you all uh, 
consider aligning yourself with, you know, let's say if Ranil Vikram Singer continues, then aligning yourselves with him? No, because, too early to no, the reality, see, one is, yes, it's too early to say, but also at the same time, I think we, the uh, CWC has been independent after a very long time in Parliament. And uh, we can't take that lightly. We have mm -hmm. to uh, take into account that we can't sit independently throughout. You know, we are not like certain other political parties in Parliament who want to come to power but don't want to come to power. You know, we can't do that. So, uh, according to us, I think when time comes, we are going to sit with each and every political leader. It can be Honorable Sajid Premadas, Honorable Honorable Kumar Dasanayak, Honorable Ranil Vikramasinghe, whoever it is. We will sit with all of them and we will explain the needs of our people. And whoever gives us a practical solution, we would be more than happy to support. Why aren't Tamil political parties coming together and uniting and working as one force? See, it see, seems to be all, no, all but, split. But, but that's the mentality I don't understand, nor do I like. What is up with this? Tamils should come together, Muslims should come together. We're all Sri Lankans at the end of the day. Right. You know, and that, that is such a toxic mentality to say, Tamil should come together. You know, you have certain Tamil MPs accusing the Sinhala MPs of being... But then raised. you're speaking on behalf of one community. You have the, t the TNA speaking and on behalf of the Northern Tamils. No, because the aspirations are different. Mm -hmm. It's two different aspirations. So, uh, two different aspirations and also two completely different mentalities. So, as I've said before, separate state, separate identity. Yeah. You know, but right now with the youth, they don't care about a separate state. They don't care about separate identity. They want three meals on the table. They want employment. They want access to education, healthcare and whatnot. But clearly no one's getting it. But the Tamil party is, by all Tamil parties uniting, it's just going to cause more divisive politics. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's that simple. What I feel is there has to be a healthy understanding between all parties. You know, so that's why recently I had, uh, you know, the CWC and there's another alliance from up country led by uh, Honorable Manu Ganesan. Yes. And, you know, we, we've had a conflict, we've had our issues, but I had gotten onto their stage not for anything, just to show that, you know, and even that I was a bit disappointed because there were certain politicians uh, from the opposition who had said I had joined SJB. But that's not the kind of politics I wanted to do. I had gotten on that stage for one simple reason, is to show that there is going to be an understanding and a friendship that will exist between the upcountry Tamil parties hereafter. They can be in the ruling party, we can be in the opposition. But Sajid's presence there gave the impression that you were... Okay, so the Indian High Commissioner was there. Was there. Does that mm -hmm. mean the Indian High Commissioner has joined, joined SJB? I had received an invitation from uh, TPA and I had gone and attended it. What mm -hmm. is wrong in that? And again, like I said, the double standards, it's amazing, you know, because, you know, I've noticed there are so many events that take place in Colombo with the Sinhala politicians. When politicians of different uh, parties, they come and sit, nobody says anything. But if it happens with a minority party, immediately the whole world has to crash and burn. So it's, a, you know, we need to change our mentality. I think people need to grow up in that sense. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I personally feel. All right, it was good uh, talking to you, uh, MPG Vantanaman. Thank you for joining us on the program today. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for you for On Fire for this week. Uh, till next time, stay safe. <laughs>